Hi everyone, Sarah here. Welcome to episode 10 of Bringing Back Botany. My apologies for the delay between episode 9 and 10. I've been bogged down with work and some family matters, but nevertheless, we're back now. We're going to go try to find some plants. It's a little bit late in the season, uh, so it's mid-July and it's getting a little warm here in East Texas, getting to about 100 degrees each day, and so I'm not sure how much we're going to find, but we'll go look anyway. I hope everyone's still doing well during this coronavirus pandemic washing your hands, wearing a mask, all that fun stuff. So with that, let's go find some plants. Alrighty everyone, we've got our first plant for today. And it looks like just a little flower, but it's actually a shrubby plant, as you can see right there. And so the plant we're looking at is Hydrolia ovata, also known as blue water leaf. It's in the Hydrophilaceae family, and it's a common perennial species found around water bodies. And it's actually used for wetland restoration purposes also. And so the plant in itself can grow between one and three feet, as we can see with our plants over there. The plant is spiny and covered in uh, rough hairs. And so blue water leaf commonly comes from a single stem and branches many times after the base of it. And so you have multiple stems coming from the base that are branched more towards the upper portions of the plant itself. The leaves on the stems are alternate along the stem. The leaves can be one to two and a half inches long and one inch wide. And you're going to have a very characteristic spine or thorn there coming out at each leaf node. So that's one of the defining characteristics vegetatively. Blue water leaf is going to flower in clusters at the terminal ends of the branches as you can see. And the flowers themselves are going to be a bright blue to purple color. And the flowers are fairly large in themselves and they can be up to one inch across. And they're going to have five very flat showy petals coming from a more funnel shaped flower coming up from the calyx. Also, it's going to have very, very prominent and conspicuous purple stamen that you can see there extending over the flowers in themselves. And so the species tends to form colonies around the edges of water bodies. And like I said earlier, it's used for wetland restoration. And so it's a very pretty plant and it's pretty drought resistant. And they can uh, be without water on the edges of these bodies for uh, up to two weeks at a time. All right, everyone, we've got our next plant species, and yeah, it's another grass. And so the grass that we're looking at is this very long, kind of linear, spiky looking grass. And this grass is known as Casmanthium sessiliflorum, or longleaf wood oats. It's in the Poaceae family, like all the other grasses. And it's a perennial grass found in which woodlands, meadows, or swamps in the southeastern United States. It typically blooms in July and August and is really characteristic in its bloom in that it just looks like a very unique linear spike. And so vegetatively, longleaf wood oats is unique in that it really only has leaves in the lower 40% of the, the plant in itself. And so there's the foliage, the leaves that you can see at the base. And I'm going to keep panning up on this one plant and you can see that there's relatively no leaves below halfway up the plant. Longleaf wood oats can typically get between one and four feet tall although it can get slightly taller and besides for the fact that it only has leafy vegetation for the first 40 or so percent of the plant in itself it's also vegetatively distinct in that the collars of the plant in itself and the leaf sheaths are going to be very, very pilose. The inflorescence of longleaf wood oats in itself is going to be a contracted panicle with the branches oppressed or ascending. And so you can actually see that's a little branch right there that my finger's holding back. But due to its growth form, it's all oppressed to the inflorescence itself and it kind of looks almost like a spike. The spikelets are going to be four to 10 millimeters long. And there's going to be four to seven and sometimes eight florets per spikelet, with the lower one or two florets within the spikelet being sterile. And now, upon maturity, the spikelets are going to disarticulate above the glooms, meaning that the glooms will stay on the plant. 
and it'll be fairly characteristic because you'll see this very linear naked looking grass with just two glooms and nothing above those glooms. Alright everyone, we've got our last plant for this episode and we're looking at another pea plant and so Fabaceae family. This one we're looking at is Camarcrista fasciculata or partridge pea. And it's an annual species that can get to one to three feet tall. It typically blooms between June and September in East Texas and it's distinguished by its characteristic leaves that upon pressing kind of fold up. It's also given the name sensitive briar for that reason. Now the plant itself can be erect as this one is or it can be sprawling across the ground but regardless it's going to have these pinnately compound leaves and the large showy flowers that are that are yellow it's going to have five large petals and ten stamen. Typically there's going to be four yellow stamen and six red stamen and you're going to have that red center dot in the middle of the flower in itself. And each flower upon maturity will have a narrow bean pod below it. Partridge pea is going to bloom in clusters at the terminal ends of the branches. And this is actually a very, very good plant for wildlife species. It's good for pollinators with the large showy flowers. Birds love the seed pods that it produces upon maturation and deer will eat the foliage as browse.